Good evening, and thank you once again for joining us for our NCSS Leaders webinar. Our topic tonight is focusing on social studies and a well-rounded education, demystifying the guidance. I'd like to welcome you to our session this evening. I'm Larry Pasca, the Executive Director of NCSS. Joining me tonight is Kat McDonald, the President of Lynchpin Strategies. I'd like to take a moment to review with you our agenda, and then in just a moment, Kat will make some introductions as well. This evening, we are here to, first of all, talk a little bit about how we got to this point in our education system in terms of the roadmap to getting the reauthorization of the uh, Elementary and Secondary Education Act. Um, over the past year, NCSS has been working hard with partners across the country to uh, ensure that the U.S. Department of Education provided some guidance to the field on some of the allowable activities and funding through the reauthorization. So we're going to talk about how to read and act on the guidance document that was recently released by the Department of Education last month. We will have time for an open Q&A among you, and we will give you some directions on how to forward your questions to us. And the thing to know about tonight's webinar is that Kat and I are here to answer some questions, and those questions that may pertain to our colleagues at the U.S. Department of Education or colleagues in other organizations, we will uh, make sure that those questions are forwarded on and that you are given a response in the near future. And lastly, we wanted to take some time to talk a little bit about this format and our collaboration together as leaders within NCSS. So tonight's attendees, um, we, we kind of considered our leaders group for this evening to be members of our board of directors, our state council presidents, our associated group chairs, and our community chairs. And we wanted those of us who had a leadership role within the organization to have this opportunity to come together to talk through the recent guidance document and also more importantly to talk through together about ways that we can collaborate together especially at a time when we're about to see a new presidential administration and new leadership turnover um, both on capitol hill and obviously in many of our states as well so the reason for our webinar this evening is is for us to to kind of pull ourselves together to share some context and share some understanding around both advocacy and future partnership that we can do together, both around the reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act and around Title IV funding itself. Kat, I'll turn it over to you. Good evening, everyone. So it's exciting to be moving forward with the next steps on implementing this long-awaited update to the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. Just as a quick refresher on how we got to this place, in December 2015, the new Stu Every Student Succeeds Act was signed into law. It was a massive multi-year effort to write that legislation, and as we all remember, it was significantly overdue, not because there was any love lost for the No Child Left Behind Act, but primarily because of a lack of consensus on how to fix the problem that were created in NCL. Um, we had an NCSS webinar on implementing the law in January of 2016 and laid out a number of opportunities and also challenges for the social studies community, including the new uh, social studies grants that were created in Title II and the large bucket of funding that was proposed and the lengthy activities that were proposed for the student success and academic achievement uh, grants, which is going to be the focus of our conversation this evening. Over the course of 2016, uh, the National Council for the Social Studies had ongoing discussions with the Department of Education on guidance related to implementing social studies, and a well-rounded education. Uh, some of you may be aware that last summer, the department put out guidance looking at STEM and identifying places in the legislation where funding could be used for science, technology, engineering, and math education. And Susan Griffin, in particular, worked at great length with Secretary King and his staff 
to encourage the Department of Education to do similar guidance for social studies. That guidance that was suggested and requested by NCSS was finally released in November of 2016. It was non-regulatory guidance around the student support and academic enrichment plans and provided additional guidance to the social studies community about opportunities in the legislation. One of the things that is important for all of us to keep in mind going forward is that the primary goal of the Every Student Succeeds Act was to take decision making out of the hands of Washington and return it to state and local policy. And so the law creates many opportunities for things to be taught, for uh, subject areas to be prioritized, and for funding to be spent, but has very few requirements. So it's critically important that folks who want to advocate for the social studies become engaged in the preparation of the state and local plans in your communities. And those state and local plans are being developed now because they need to be approved and ready for implementation in September 2017. Now it might seem like, given that the law was signed almost a year ago, and that the plans have to be ready to be implemented this coming September, that perhaps opportunities may have already been missed. And for anybody who is concerned about not having engaged in the process to date, I would say that it has taken states and local education agencies quite a long time to get their arms around the requirements of the new law. It has taken the Department of Education, actually in Washington times, uh, sort of very, they've been very quick in issuing regulatory and non-regulatory guidance, but there are still a lot of decisions to be made, and so it is not too late for folks to be getting involved. We think it's really vital that social studies advocates get engaged if you have not had an opportunity to do that so far. As we said, the state and local plans need to be ready for implementation this coming September. And the law does require participation from several key groups in the development of those plans including parents and teachers, as well as others, um, the business community and other stakeholders who have a, an interest in the outcome of the educational system. Among other things, the state plans need to outline what activities are going to be funded with the student success and academic enrichment grants to promote a well-rounded education. Now, it is worth observing that the student success and academic enrichment grants are not competitive grants. They, will, they are funds that will be distributed by formula to all states. The states have to include in their plan how those funds will be used. And then the states need to turn around and distribute a minimum of 95% of the money that they receive to local education agencies. The amount of SSAE grant money that each state and each local education agency receives will be based on their Title I population and also, of course, based on the amount of money that Congress appropriates for these grants. Um, currently, the Congress has not made final funding decisions. And the process that we thought was going to move forward fairly quickly after the election is currently on hold, pending some additional guidance to congressional Republican leadership from the new Trump administration. The Senate bill contains about $300 million for these grants nationwide. The House bill contains about a billion dollars for these grants nationwide. And we don't yet know exactly how much money will be provided. The law says that the minimum grant to an LEA 
needs to be $10,000, assuming that enough money is appropriated. And if insufficient funds are appropriated to meet the minimum grant amount to each LEA, then grants would be reduced proportionally according to how much money is allocated. There are some small LEAs that are likely to get fairly small grants, and the law allows LEAs to join together to combine grants and make more efficient use of resources. But certainly, even at a fairly small appropriation, large LEAs uh, stand to receive a million dollars or more. One thing to know about the SFA grants is that if the appropriation is limited, the grants to small local education agencies may be very small. And as we'll see in just a moment, many activities are eligible. One possible approach is to take is that this is a competition across subject areas and activities. And certainly, social studies advocates need to be in a position uh, to advocate for the teaching of social studies. However, if we look at it as a zero-sum game, um, the resources just aren't sufficient to cover all of the needs. And so I would suggest thinking creatively about how we can advocate for the social studies and how we can collaborate with other um, areas in the curriculum in order to uh, make resources go further. So the department put out guidance for the social studies, and it is fairly detailed. This page from the guidance, um, shows that the funds for SFA activities will be fairly stretched. The activities that can be funded through this grant fall into three broad categories. And frankly, even one of these categories and one activity within each of these categories could easily have um, efficiently and effectively utilized all of the money that is likely to come in. The first category of activities is to provide a well-rounded educational opportunity to all students. And remember, these funds are focused on Title I schools that may have fewer educational opportunities than others. Subject areas that are included in the well-rounded education certainly include all of the subjects under the, for, under the social studies, but also foreign language, arts and music education, um, career counseling and college counseling, programming around STEM, including computer science, and providing access to accelerated learning opportunities, including advanced placement, excuse me, advanced placement programs and international baccalaureate programs. So as you can see from the last bullet, strengthening instruction in American history, civics, economics, geography, government, and environmental education certainly has prominence, but there are many other topic areas that can be covered with these grants. As if that wasn't enough, um, these funds can also be used to promote safe and healthy students, including community and parent involvement, mental health services, anti-bullying, um, re-entry programs and transition services for justice-involved youth, and um, anti-obesity uh, initiatives. There's quite a lot in this category. And then many of the hardware and software activities that were previously funded elsewhere have been put into the SSA program activities as well. That includes professional development for educators and school leaders to help them use technology to personalize learning, as well as um, the, the purchase of and delivery of technology-based services. There's certainly a lot that is eligible for these grants. One of the big questions that many folks in the social studies community have asked is to say, 
I know that somewhere, somebody is making decisions, putting together plans on behalf of my state, but I don't know who that is or how to find them. And um, our colleagues at ASCD have put together a really valuable resource that is available to you online to help you answer those questions. And I would like to thank Ted McConnell, Ted McConnell of the Campaign for the Civic Mission of Schools for finding and sharing this with us. Um, on this slide, we have put the uh, home page for this section of the ASCD website. Um, and again, this was put together for a broad range of uh, education folks to help you identify the decision makers in your state who are going to be working on implementation of the entire act. As you can see at the bottom, there are state ESSA resources, there is information about task forces and committees, there are lists and timing and dates for opportunities for input, and then periodic information updates. And two of the most important pieces of information that you can find here are your state's timeline and also the members of the decision-making committees. In some cases, committees have already been appointed but you may know people on those committees and can weigh in with them. And in other cases, committees are still being assembled. So let's take a brief look at some examples of the kinds of resources on this website. I'm from Virginia, and so I thought I would pull some of the information that pertains to Virginia. And here is the uh, homepage from the Virginia Department of Education that is linked to from the ASCD website. You'll see that there are copies of federal ESSA communications as well as state-based information. In particular, it shows the timeline for Virginia's state plan development. Um, this shows that the public review of the plan will commence, will commence in January and February. So they're giving themselves a pretty short timeline to complete the draft plan, but there are still opportunities to weigh in. And then um, the state plan will be finalized by March 2017 and submitted to the Department of Education for its review so that it will be ready for implementation by September. The website also shows who it is at the Virginia Department of Education who is on the implementation committee. It gives uh, names, titles, and contact information. Again, this looks different for every state, but there's great information for every state on this, well, on this website. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to Larry to um, open it up for questions and answers. And we will see what we can do to help respond to questions and concerns that folks might have. Kat, thank you very much for providing that, um, that really deep dive for us. I, I, I'm hoping that it's very helpful to all of our attendees this evening. If you've read the guidance document and you just kind of needed to hear it kind of deconstructed in this way, um, we hope that it was very helpful. I also know that looking at the resources that were provided from ASCD, and again, Ted, thank you as well for, for not only sharing that, but also sharing additional guidance that I know has gone out to several social educators around the country around how to secure these funds. Um, we, at this time, want to turn this over to an open Q&A around the guidance document. And how, how we'll work it is, is the following. Um, please use the hand raising icon. Um, when we call on you, please type your question into the text box. Um, we're going to curate all of these questions. So this webinar is being recorded. We will be sending the link out to all folks who were invited this evening because we know some of our colleagues could not make it this evening. Um, some of our questions Kat may be able to answer this evening. Um, she's going to mostly handle questions um, regarding the guidance document itself and state and group level advocacy efforts that we can take. Um, I will handle questions regarding NCSS resources and any support among our community that we can start to build together. Um, we also are aware that some of your questions may require further clarification from the U.S. Department of Education, so we will 
Uh, we've been in touch with Secretary King's staff already and alerted them that we may be forwarding some questions from tonight's webinar um, on to his staff for, for further answers. So we've got you covered. Um, we look forward to your questions. If you have any at this time, um, please use the hand raising icon and we will ask you to submit your question in the, in the uh, chat box. Oh, and thank you, Anna. Yes, <laughs> I forgot to tell you where the hand raising icon was. If you look at the top of your screen, um, you'll see a figure with uh, his hand raised. You can click on raise hand. Um, that will allow you to raise your hand. You'll see that signal. Thank you for reminding us of that. There I am raising my hand. Nick, please start us off with your first question. Nick Lawrence. Hi. Um, can you hear me? We can hear you well. Oh, great. Uh, my name is Dick Lawrence. I teach. Uh, actually, I'm an administrator in the Bronx. And I'm going to take part in the Legislative Day on December 1st. I'm very interested in knowing what your thoughts are in terms of advocating for the social studies, um, like support with the ESEA piece, uh, when we go to Washington and talk to our representatives. I'm, I'm already planning to talk to one of my reps from New Jersey and from New York. So, uh, Nick, I'll start us off, and then Kat, Kat, or Kat, do you want to start? Go right ahead, Larry. Okay. Um, so just very briefly for everyone who's, who's, who may or may not be aware, um, our legislative day on December 1st is meant to be follow-up both to this session as well as um, some time as you're in Washington, D.C. to meet with your representatives on Capitol Hill. Um, we understand that as the appropriations process is, is ongoing, what we'd like to do is is develop and share with you a series of talking points. We will have a morning session um, for about an hour where, where Kat will go through um, some of the things that you may want to get, uh, you, you may want to express to any of the staffers or and, and or direct representatives that you'll be speaking with. Kat can talk about that process in just a moment. Um, one of the things that we wanted to have as an outcome of this day is to both build that body of talking points together, have those of us that can attend go to Capitol Hill and talk about social studies, and then have a debrief session at the end of the day. And the idea behind the debrief session is for us to talk about the conversations that we've had, um, some of the feedback that we were, we were receiving from our visits, and also to kind of plan the next steps going forward. Because what we'd like to do is continue to build an advocacy agenda as a council, and we'd like to build that with you, and we'd like to ensure that the conversations that you have on that day um, can inform kind of our future goal setting going into 2017. Kat, can you talk a little bit about the specific talking points you may want our members to focus on this year? Absolutely. I'm so excited that you're going to be participating in the Legislative Day. Thank you for coming to town and making that a priority. Um, so the exciting thing about the timing of the NCSS conference is that there's a good possibility Congress will be making decisions on the funding of the grant programs we've been talking about essentially right then while we are in town. So we will not be writing all of the talking points until probably 24 hours before so that they can reflect exactly what's happening on the ground when you're there. In general, however, what I would say is that although members of Congress won't be directly engaged in, for example, the state planning process that we've talked about a lot tonight. It's vitally important to educate our members of Congress who represent you about what is going on with social studies in their state so that they can be looking for opportunities, whether it's in appropriations or other legislation that comes up, to help elevate the teaching of civics, economics, government, and history. One of the things that I've found to be most effective is bringing specific examples, both anecdotes and facts and figures, about what's going on in the state when you come to Washington. And time and again, when I have joined 
CSS members for these meetings, we'll hear from a congressional office that, for example, they think that um, education decisions ought to be made at home in the state or by local schools and local school districts. But then when they hear stories like one NCSS member who shared that in her middle school, students could meet their social studies requirement by volunteering to file papers and answer telephones in the front office of the school, then that's really stunning news to congressional offices. Um, the office that we talked to that said we shouldn't be providing designated professional development funds for the social studies because there's lots of money that can be used by schools for social studies if they need it, was stunned to get the results of an informal poll of Iowa teachers showing that more than half of the social studies teachers polled in Iowa had not even been offered a single professional development opportunity in social studies in the last two years. And it's certainly true that it was an option for schools and school districts, but since social studies isn't tested, it also wasn't being taught and it also wasn't um, professional development opportunities were not being made available to teachers. So we will be figuring out what the specific ask and the specific talking points are a little bit closer to the conference. But as you are thinking about what you might need to bring with you, a little bit of information about what's happening with social studies in your state will be very helpful. And a large part of what you'll be doing is educating folks about the need to elevate the teaching of social studies, regardless of how we draft the specific talking points on that day. I'd also like to add to that um, that NCSS conducts research every year. Um, many of you may be aware of this when you um, give your students a social studies survey, and part of that data is used to help link kids to financial aid information and information about specific colleges that they're interested in. Part of the survey that's collected is also a survey of our members. So we collect thousands of responses among our members, and we're about to um, release our annual report. It's a 2015 report that includes data from our members that submitted information that um, highlights the areas that are of biggest interest to them, of biggest need and concern, graduation requirements across the states, how many credits of social studies are kids taking in every grade level. So, the, so that data will be shared at our conference. And one of the things I'm going to recommend to all of our members that we do with that data is, again, it's, it's the start of a conversation. But what's helpful about it is here are the, uh, you know, Here's, here's the information that thousands of our members across the country are expressing about the key priorities for social studies, the areas where funding are needed, um, the areas in which professional development would be needed. So we're starting to um, pull some information now and set context around this research report so that you can also use that data. Um, if you can't use it at Legislative Day, you can use that data when you're going back in your states and talking with colleagues around your state about the importance of social studies education. I'm going to, uh, the next question comes in the text box from Shannon. Where are we with supplanting versus supporting? Um, I saw some congressmen opposed some of the language presented. It's a good question. And um, this goes back to the tug and pull when the legislation was developed around state flexibility versus federal efforts to ensure accountability for the federal funds that were provided. So there's language in multiple places in the ESSA saying that when states are given funding for certain purposes, that that money must supplement what the state was already spending in those areas instead of supplanting it. So for example, if you are getting Title I funds to provide educational opportunities for low-income children in your state, that Title I money coming from the feds is intended to be in addition to what the state was already spending, and it is not supposed to enable you to cut the money that you were spending on low-income children and replace it 
with the Title I federal funds. The argument that you're talking about is over how to define and how to enforce the supplement, not supplant requirements. So the Department of Education under the Obama administration a couple of weeks ago put out draft regulations describing how they planned to enforce the supplement, not supplant provisions. And there are certain particularly Republican leaders who were deeply engaged in the legislation. Um, Senate Health Committee Chairman Alexander of Tennessee being one of the most vocal folks on this, who feel that the proposal by the Obama administration goes beyond the authority of the law and that the Obama administration is trying to exert more authority over state choices than was intended in the law. I think this is a case where other people who were in the room with Chairman Alexander co-authoring the law would disagree, um, but I think that it is also very likely that the supplement not supplant regulations will be one of the first ones um, re-examined and perhaps rewritten in the new administration. So stay tuned. That controversy is going to be with us for a little while. Thank you. And I'd like to recognize uh, Steve Lamort. Steve, do you have a question you'd either like to type in or speak over a microphone? And Steve, you may want to just check and see if your microphone is not on mute. Okay, thank you, Steve. Um, Steve has responded, given that this funding can be used for a variety of actions, subjects, etc., I feel like social studies folks in LEAs will be under competitive pressure to propose some really innovative, high leverage activities in order to secure funds, as opposed to them being diverted to other activities. Is there anything NCSS can offer us in the way of innovative ideas, research supported programs, a forum for sharing these things, et cetera? Thank you, Steve. That's a very good question. Um, so in terms of what we can do at NCSS, I think we need to continue building a body of, of understanding together. And one of the ways that we propose to do that, I know this isn't going to be helpful to everybody because not every state council president can join us, but um, we are um, having a state council president's meeting again at NCSS this year. Uh, that will be on Saturday the 3rd from 2.40 to 4 p.m. We are going to be um, sending a, a more formal announcement out by tomorrow about this meeting. This year at the State Council President's meeting, um, we're going to have um, Kat provide a, a, a brief overview and update for us. We are then going to turn over the rest of the meeting to allow some conversation between um, our, our members and officers in attendance and, and all of you as State Council leaders. The reason for this session, I was just talking with our President-elect Harry Cherry this evening, who is going to be chairing that meeting. Um, Terry very much wants to hear from our state council leaders about the types of ideas and practices that we as a, as a national council can do to support state councils. I think that part of that, um, that, that listening is, is going to involve what you're describing, Steve, which is what are some programs and resources, what are things that are, that are um, research-driven, empirically-based that we can not only promote and support, but perhaps grow together as organizations. We're also going to provide um, additional time at 4 p.m. after that meeting ends for state councils to have time to talk together and share practices together. And Terry and I pledge to stay in the room and, and just help facilitate that conversation and certainly um, take your ideas. That's one form um, that we're proposing. A bigger form, uh, quite honestly, and it's, I'm gonna jump ahead just a little bit if, if, if uh, Kat and Anna, if you don't mind, and that is to look at um, 
ways that this webinar is the start of a larger conversation across all of our leaders. We know that right now we have a very big opportunity in social studies education to um, really build a national conversation around practice in our discipline. We know that at this point in time, we have to come together and talk through not just the problems that have plagued our discipline, but real solutions and real solutions that quite honestly are, are grounded in, Steve, very much what you're describing. They're innovative, they're research-based, they're things that we can scale, they're things that whether we are a state council, the national council, a school district, a school building, we are able to understand this as a viable um, social studies program um, that will help with student achievement, that will help our teachers do their jobs well. So what I'm going to propose is that, um, I'm going to go to our next slide in just a moment, but I want to propose that we think about how this forum right now as a leader's webinar could become a more systemic part of our organization. I'm, I'm very much welcome having our board members, having our community chairs, having our council presidents and leaders come together periodically to talk through specific issues. Tonight's issue was talking about the guidance document. Perhaps future topics could be one like what you were describing. Um, to think about how do we start um, creating, if you will, an innovation agenda together. That, that might be one possibility. Kat, I don't know if you have anything you'd like to add. You know, it's a great question, and I do think that there are people who are working on this. And two examples of conversation that I'm aware of. Um, I know Michelle Herzog put together a guide talking about how social studies content could be used to help teaching of literacy so that students were getting, while they were working towards literacy goals, they were getting social studies content and that was informing reading and writing and discussions in classrooms. Um, I also um, have become aware of work that the Constitutional Rights Foundation is doing using online approaches to researching a civic engagement issue of interest to students. So I do think that there are partnerships and places where we can have cross-discipline, but more than that, sort of cross-objectives collaboration. And it's really a matter of uh, having people bring those to the table and trying to inventory and curate them. I'd also like to build off of um, a comment that um, Ted has just expressed as well that kind of plays off of um, uh, Steve's question. So Ted has offered that really taking a look at programming courses and PD from all three of the quote unquote buckets on our chart. So for example, how civics can combat bullying through the use of digital media. So one of the things that I'm very pleased about so far, and I wanna thank many of you who are on this webinar now that um, have, have let me listen to some of the needs that you've been thinking about over the past month that I've been with NCSS. Um, as part of my kind of quote unquote listening tour, I've been asking about the resources that you value from NCSS and the things that you're hoping to see from us in the future. The, the main comment that I've heard universally from every single person is how can we get more content in the hands of classroom teachers immediately? How do we know that that content is, is, is based in good practice, good research? How do we know that it's, some, it's content that could be applicable to everyone from a methods professor to an administrator to, to a classroom teacher. So I, I want to um, kind of acknowledge Ted and Steve, both of your comments to say that I think we can start building that, that um, the, the frame for that to happen starting at this convention. I'll be very happy to talk with any of you who'd like to kind of um, talk either separately or in a larger form like the state council presidents or um, any of our other uh, convenings. I'm going to ask committee chairs if they'd like to get together just so that I can um, listen and learn from you as well. I think the time is right for us to do exactly what you're suggesting. I think identifying what are all of the specific types of content that we really need to see put out there now. How do we become a clearinghouse for that? How do we become creators of that? So I, I acknowledge what you're saying, and I think that's going to be our evolution now as an organization working together. So um, please, let's continue to talk through this at, at the convention and also offline, especially if we're not able to attend the convention in person. Stephanie's question, Kat, have you heard of any states that are including social studies in their plan? So I've, I've heard a smattering of folks 
who have been doing outreach to the committees that are writing the plans and have gotten engaged, but I haven't heard from anybody that their state plan is finished and they've either got positive or negative outcomes to report yet. And thank you, uh, I, I won't read all the comments in the text box, but thank you, Steve, for um, providing an example of a type of program that we've looked at. Um, Kat, you've responded, and I'm just checking to see, are there any other questions that we currently have? Anyone else to raise their hand with questions or to type in the box? And Don, uh, thank you for sharing civic engagement will be a part of the state plan in Kansas. And, uh, you know, Steve is, so, so Steve and I share a history both uh, with the New York State Council. New York, the, uh, the roll-up plan has involved bringing professional organization leaders from across the state um, to the state education department to help inform development of the plan. And I know, Steve, you've been a part of that process representing the New York State Council for the Social Studies um, in that work. Any other questions in our open Q&A before we move to the last part of our agenda? Barry. So you have your microphone on, perhaps. Barry, feel free to type in your comment if you're not able to um, uh, have your if your if your microphone's not working properly. Can you hear me now? Hi, Barry. Yes, we can. Hello, Welcome. Hello. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you. I was uh, just wondering. The only thing that I had heard in regards to policy about education uh, during the campaigning of the current uh, uh, president-elect Trump was in regards to school choice. Were there any uh, specific things related to social studies or social science education and policy uh, that he was that he may have spoken to that may have been lost in? all of the different rhetoric that took place this uh, this past election. I'll go back on mute. So I can take the first stab at this. Um, I think it was not lost on educators or parents that any level of detailed discussion of education was really largely missing from the campaign. Um, one candidate did have fairly detailed education plans if you went to the website, and the other candidate did not. If there was any discussion by the president-elect of social studies during the campaign, it certainly did not come to my attention, and I'd welcome um, others, if you are aware of comments or policy proposals, please share, because I'm sure we'd all be very interested to hear about it. In conversations with folks who are connected to the education transition team, um, the big conversation, as you observed, is around school choice. And it is widely anticipated that that will be one of the first fully fledged or, or more fleshed out education proposals rolled out by the new administration. Um, but otherwise, the education conversation regarding K-12 education is largely being driven by folks on Capitol Hill at this point, and it's largely around ESSA implementation with a little bit of conversation about funding. Any further questions at this time?
So for our, um, the last portion of our meeting, um, we wanted to spend some time talking further about our collaboration across groups. So again, we're defining groups as um, collaboration across all of our, our leaders in the organization, our members of the board of directors, our, our community chairs, our committee chairs, our state council presidents. We would like this to be the start of a larger conversation if there's desire to have that. Um, and we'd like to talk a little bit about your ideas and how we can support each other in building a shared national voice for social studies education. Again, going into a new administration, um, you know, at, at all levels certainly, but especially at a federal level, how do we help create a shared voice, shared understanding? Um, we have some suggestions tonight about how to do that. Um, one of the proposals that, that we would like to offer on the table is convening us together as leaders periodically to address specific um, topics or, or, or critical issues or themes that impact all of us and that we can also take back to our professional roles beyond the social studies or, or, or beyond our work with the, with the council. So I'd just like to solicit your, your input in kind of answering this question um, together, uh, whether it's a, a quarterly uh, webinar series, monthly, whether it's conference calls, whether it is other, some other form of communication that you would like from us if it would help to have that. We would like to put that structure in place if it is something that's of, of, of value to you. Again, feel free to type questions in the box or raise your hand, or if you have a microphone, feel free to turn it on. Hi, Barry, go right ahead. Barry Thomas from Nebraska, and I just wanted to uh, make a statement in regards to something that the Iowa State Council uh, did. They invited um, their neighboring state council leaders to their state council uh, annual conference. Um, I was able to attend uh, representing Nebraska, uh, picked up a ton of um, just some great ideas that I saw that they were doing, and I thought that that would be something that, uh, if it's not being done in your state, and maybe something to take advantage of is just inviting different states' leadership to come and participate in your annual conference if that's something that you haven't done yet. Big shout out to Iowa and Stephanie for that. Thank you, Barry. It's, it, th thank you for your input. It seems like it's also well received in our chat box as well. Um, just going back to an earlier comment um, from Ted, um, who had mentioned that there are several of us already partnered in government affairs work. We have been working with Kat. And again, very grateful, um, Kat, for your, for your leadership and guidance as well in, in working with us and in advocating for social studies um, to our congressional leaders. Um, one of the things that, that Kat and I have talked about is in the coming year, um, helping us as members and as leaders within the organization um, um, to, to facilitate this process and almost do kind of more of a turnkey training model, if you will, um, where if we can help provide the guidance to you that you can then in turn um, bring back um, to your districts, to your councils, to other organizations that you work with. We're very aware that there's a very wide network around the country of social studies practitioners and leaders, but um, sometimes it's hard to keep us all connected and keep us all focused together in a shared voice and a shared vision. And so we'd like to help facilitate that with you. And, and thus, that's why we wanted both to convene you tonight and talk about future convenings as well. Um, other feedback we're getting, quarterly update on legislative issues. Um, we do uh, you know, plan to certainly provide um, frequent, especially you know, in, a, in a changing administration and, a, and in a transition period such as this one, uh, it, it will be very important for us to keep each other connected and informed. Um, Semi-regular webinars among social studies leaders, again, that's um, an idea that we, we wanted to kind of float out there with you and see if, uh, if there would be interest in, in, in us doing that. Drafting some, Stephanie, drafting some language for state councils to put in their newsletters regarding ESSA. Additional feedback, either for the text box or for those of us with a microphone. Hmm. 
Nick. Nick, if you're able to use the microphone, feel free to speak into it. Otherwise, please feel free to type into the chat box. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. So uh, something that you were, I, I think, a couple people have gone to uh, is this, this idea of, like, what is the sort of ebb and flow of the, the legislature, both on the state level, but also obviously on the national level? terms of when is an appropriate time to reach out and advocate. I mean, it's always appropriate, but a lot of people don't know that there are particular times of year to like sort of rally support and like get in touch with our, our representatives. So I think that um, in terms of a leadership team, making sure that that team is very in tune to that so that we know even beyond talking points, like uh, Stephanie was, was pointing out, like when do we convey those things? Because if it's, you know, Certain times of year, representatives are less interested in hearing them. But if it's you know the week of the you know last bit of the allocations, that's super important. So I'll just start uh, with an answer, and, and Kat, I don't know if there's more you'll want to add beyond this. Um, I think one of the uh, areas that we're very motivated uh, by is, cre is expanding our advocacy toolkit that's on our website so that there are more talking points that you can use throughout the year. So obviously, as you're pointing out, there are critical times during the year when um, we need to be mobilized or when uh, decisions will be made that will affect. I'm sorry, I'm getting a little feedback. Hold on one second. There we go. That's better. Thank you. Um, where decisions will be made where, where we will have to be making these phone calls right away. We will have to be sending emails or, or launching our voter voice. We also know that sometimes things can come up rather spontaneously that we'll need to react to. And I think when we were going through the reauthorization process over a year ago, you saw a lot of communications from NCSS very quickly asking you to, to mobilize. And, you know, uh, unfortunately or not, um, sometimes the political process happens uh, close to vacation times or around weekends where it may seem like, oh, geez, I, I, I have to step up. So what, what we want to do is start developing those talking points and that we can pick and choose among the ones that we want to use when we need to use them. There may be some that are relevant by state depending on the issue going on. There may be some that are uh, that we all have to really address right away with all of our represented leaders. So I guess what I'm saying is that we, we may want to also parse out what is going to be state-specific issues, and then how can we lean on each other to share what worked in one state versus another? Some of them, again, are going to be national-level issues that we're going to want to build that national voice around. So um, I think our toolkit will just have to expand and provide uh, guidance that we can both use universally as well as have customized depending on our need. You know, it's a great question and observation, and I think um, something that would be really valuable to have as part of an ongoing conversation. So you're absolutely right. There are certain windows of opportunity when it's vital for legislators, whether they're federal or state, to be hearing from constituents. Um, the other reality there, of course, is that in those critical windows of opportunity, people are busy, and it's really hard to get to a congressional or legislative office, whether it's the member or the staff, unless you have an existing relationship. Because in those critical times when legislation is moving, the folks who are able to make contact and get through and get their emails read or their telephone calls returned are the people whose names and perspectives are known to the legislators and their staff. So we can do in, you know, within our um, pretty limited budget, a pretty good job of helping to explain the cycles of, for example, appropriations, the timing when folks should be weighing in. We can support you in doing that. But the effectiveness of your outreach and your ability to get through will really be enhanced by 
the development of relationships, which is something that you can work on at almost any time. It's a lot harder for NCSS as a national organization to be tracking those timetables across all 50 states. Um, so one of the things that Larry and Anna and I have been talking about is trying to develop a system where we can be supporting state councils and providing information at the federal level and also providing tools where the approaches and the processes that you are using at the federal level can be adapted relatively quickly and easily by you with a little bit of information about what's going on at the state level as well. And we're excited about continuing that conversation um, you know, without over-promising because NCSS has limited resources and there are a lot of state legislatures out there. Um, but I think that there are things that we do at the federal level um, that are adaptable and applicable for state legislatures. And we look forward to talking with you about how to be of more help. Just also want to comment on a, a posting that Ted just made um, that there should be a government affairs committee in each state council that's supported by NCSS. Um, this is a really compelling idea. I'm not sure how many state councils currently have um, some sort of committee that, or, or arm or, or group of volunteers that is actively coordinating a message and perhaps even scheduling time to meet with elected leaders. And, and, and I know some states have lobby days and, and, and you know, advocacy groups that do meet that way. Um, that's a really good idea, and I think what I also like about that idea is if, if that's part of our kind of package together going forward, if you will, of developing talking points and developing some shared resources together. I see that some of us have posted um, links to, to docs on Google Docs and other sites that, that could be useful. We should talk about that a little bit more because I think that it, it is going to be critical that you have um, the resources that you need at a state level to take action. And um, I, I know even some of our stronger councils, that's just that's that's a hard um, type of committee to have set up if you don't have it. And Stephanie, thank you. Iowa, you have an advocacy point person on your board. So that may be someone to learn from or Stephanie talking longer term about how that's structured in Iowa and, and what that person does and, and, and how that role has been working. So a few of us are typing. I'm just going to open it up to any last minute questions. I know we're uh, running over by a few minutes. Um, if you do have to, to leave, we certainly understand. If you want to stay on for just another minute or two, we can wrap up. We would we'd love to continue getting your feedback. And thank you to Stephanie for sharing a link to a resource that was put together by Stephanie and David Clem, another one of our board members at our 2016 Summer Leadership Institute. And again, please know that since this webinar is being recorded and will be saved, um, we will also be going through these resources as well to make sure that they are up to date on our own website as well as um, kind of curated again uh, for, for our leadership group going forward. So I want to thank each and every one of you for taking time from a very busy evening as we're entering a uh, Thanksgiving holiday season. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time this evening to come together for your input, your feedback. Um, I hope to see many of you at our uh, annual conference in just a couple of weeks. Um, the announcement about the state council president's meeting will be coming soon. Our community chairs meetings, those announcements have gone out already. Um, we look forward to seeing you there. We want to continue this conversation with you. Please feel free to reach out at any time um, with feedback about tonight's webinar. You can email me directly at lpaska at ncss.org. I'm happy to get your feedback and learn how we could make future convenings of our leaders um, stronger as well. Um, I want to thank Kat. Thank you so much for taking the time this evening to share your um, understanding of the federal guidance to date and the context for the work that's been done both with NCSS and the federal government, as well as just um, the advocacy efforts that have been going on with our members in Congress around social studies. We very much appreciate your expertise and your time. And um, we look forward to, to partnering again together soon on a future webinar and other activities.